Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm very pleased to be in the office of Dr. Amir Anbari. He's the ambassador of Iraq to the United Nations, and uh, I'm very, very uh, happy to welcome him to the Conversation seri Series, Dr. Anbari. Yeah, most welcome. There are a number of things that we would like to talk to you about. One of the lead questions now, this being June of 1990, is that just recently there was called the Arab Summit right. in Baghdad. Your country was the host to that. Uh, there was a rather wide-ranging agenda, but the primary question in most of the world's mind was the, the immigration of Soviet, Soviet uh, Jewish people into Israel. It was a major area of contention. But I wonder if maybe you could discuss a little bit about the, that dimension of the Arab Summit and uh, some of the other uh, questions that were brought up there and the, and the implications of that Arab Summit meeting in, uh, in 1990. Yes, indeed. You are right. That was the first item, uh, although it wasn't the only item. Uh, the, Mr. Arafat, the president of Palestine State and the chairman of the PLO, uh, called for the summit to be held in Baghdad in order to find ways and means to contain the damage which the uh, emigration of Soviet Jews and Eastern European Jews uh, to the occupied lands in Palestine mm -hmm. because to us that wasn't really a freedom of immigration or a human rights question. It was a colonization of a land that belonged to the Arabs, belonged to the Palestinians. And as you know the Geneva Convention, uh, the fourth convention of Geneva prohibits and the occupying authority, the occupying power to change the demography uh, of the occupied areas. And this is what the Zionist organization and the Israeli government, what Mr. Shamir in particular, is doing that. Mm -hmm. And that was, of course, in violation of all norms of international law as well as of the Geneva Convention. And this has been a particular concern to the, the, the whole of the Arab world and the leadership indeed, of the indeed. Arab world. Indeed, not only the whole of the Arab world, I believe even to the whole world, because uh -huh. it hasn't happened uh, quite often in recent years for a, a new population to replace another population. Uh -huh. This is not a question of individual right to move from one country to another. Uh -huh. It was a question of the rights of the Palestinians to maintain their land, to maintain their houses and their farms, rather than bring someone from Soviet Union or Poland or what have you and kick them, kick the Arabs out of their yeah. cities, out of their uh, houses and uh, house and settle the new immigrants. Now this, 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 this refers specifically to the occupied territories right, right. and the fact as that well as uh, to Jerusalem. Mr. Shamir had said we need a greater Israel in order to accommodate them right. and the fear that there was going to be a settlement of these new immigrants in the occupied territories was the matter of particular concern to sure, your leadership. Because, uh, of course there was another aspect to it that was really to torpedo the whole piece of process uh -huh. which Mr. Baker and the United Nations Security Council have been trying to coax the Israelis in order to reach a peaceful settlement with the Arabs mm -hmm. by giving them, you know, the right for self-determination and the right to, to uh, have their own state in the Western uh, Bank as well as in Gaza and uh, in the uh, Arab, uh, other parts of the Arab territories. Of course, what the Israelis did is trying to torpedo the whole piece of process mm -hmm. because there will be no land even to, for the Arabs to live on, mm -hmm. you see, and then they will become simply new wave of refugees. Yeah, uh, well, and particularly this is quieting now that the Shamir government is able to form a right-wing government in Israel in the intervening time since the Arab summit. They've been able to form a government, uh, Sharon and others that are in the government, Levy in the government. It must be, it's a disquieting time because the, uh, the prospects for the peace process, the very forthcoming attitude that Mr. Arafat had demonstrated uh, toward a peace process, seems not to have been able to come to avail, so people who are, let's say, in a certain sense, uh, radically inclined on both sides, perhaps, uh, it's becoming a more dangerous time as far as... Well, the actually, as, 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 yes, uh, definitely, because uh, it was uh, rightly described that uh, Mr. Shami's government, the new government, is a war government, and definitely they are determined first to destroy the Intifada, that is to uh, kill and shoot all the young children who are trying to fight and to make their position clear by not referring to any sort of violence except by stones and other things. And secondly, by kicking out as many Palestinians from the West Bank into either Jordan or outside uh, the occupied territories. And that, that option which had been mentioned is being mentioned more, and, uh, I mean, uh, is a very outside option, is being mentioned more and more sure. by more and more people, sure. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, don't be surprised, we won't be surprised if Israel trying to really 
uh, launch a surprise attack on one of or more of Arab countries in order to engulf the whole region into an entirely different sort of situation and forget about the peace process, forget about the Intifada, forget about the rights of the Palestinians to have their own government. In order to think they can gain their interest by taking a warlike position, sure. a warrior sure. position as far as that part of the world is concerned? Sure. That they carry out the expansionist policy which Mr. Shamir and his likes would like to pursue. From a certain perspective, you can go back to 1947, it's been an expansionist policy. That's that all the time. From the very establishment of Israel, there were to be a 50-50 division by the UN Accord uh, between Palestine and Jewish people. There's more and more encroachment upon that all the time. Now you think that there's the, uh, the idea to establish the greater Israel, which includes the West Bank and even the Golan and parts of Lebanon. That's and it. where does this stop, in your estimation? Or well, I don't know. I don't know. They gain the ultimate kind of security that they they keep talking that they need to have or something. Well, you see, in this world, really, there is no way of having absolute security. Mm. Uh, and as long as your neighbors are not secure, you cannot really uh, have or maintain security. The, unfortunately, it is the Israeli option to insist on military security rather than having sort of peace and good relations with their neighbors. But as you know, the expansionist policy of the Israeli government is not new. If you go to the Knesset uh, in, uh, in Israel, you will see a big sign saying that from the Euphrates to the Nile, or from the Nile to the Euphrates. In the Knesset? In the, the Knesset, Knesset yes, yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't realize uh, that, no. And as a matter of fact, even though they mentioned the, Ni the Euphrates, but if you see the, the map of Greater Israel, as they envisage it, even it touched the Iraqi-Iranian borders, across the Tigris as well. So this might not take place in, in our lifetime, but definitely the process of expansionism on the part of Israel has been going on from the 40s up to now. Oh. In 1947, 1956, 1967, 1973, and even now. Mm -hmm. yes. and, it, and it continues, and, the, and the, uh, from their perspective. From the perspective of an American audience, and of course you're, you're here are in, in New York City, you've been ambassador to the United States, you've been ambassador to uh, Britain, you're now ambassador at the United Nations, you have a feeling for the for the West and for the United States and the Anglo mentality, as it were, and so forth. From the standpoint of the United States, many people in the United States see Israel as a relatively small country. Maybe you could help set it right in terms of the way the Arab people see it. Uh, three to four million people only, relatively small. That they are the David against the great Goliath of this masked Arab nation and so forth, and that they have been able to win is an indication of the fact that they have been so well mobilized by their ideas and that they have a, they have a system that is uh, one that has to be given credence. Uh, how, how are we to view the fact that so small people have been able to be so successful in war, six days and so forth, and uh, to the general uh, attitudes that we hear expressed in the Western press that says Israel is, in a certain sense, an extension of Western democratic values. There are unbending ally and the general attitudes that the American people feel toward that part of the world. I wonder if maybe you could comment on that from the standpoint well, of a well-informed uh, Arab observer. Sure, I'll try to be brief and to be uh, as fair as possible here. Mm -hmm. uh, for the question of democracy, of course, it's a fallacy in Israel, seeing you know, the way they are treating the children of the Intifada, seeing the maneuvers in the parliament, the way that Mr. Shamir have to bribe, as a matter of fact, so many members of the Knesset in order to form this government or that government. Mm -hmm. So the question of democracy to me is totally false. Now, about the population, as you know, the Israeli is the most militaristic country in the world. Mm. Almost every adult male is a member of the army or is, is, is ready to go and fight any moment. Uh, secondly, in no time, really, Israel was involved in a war uh, by itself. But all the time, the United States, as you know, in 1967, uh, 1973, United States extended even a bridge of military aid. Uh, as a matter of fact, some people uh, thought that the U.S. government at the time endangered the national security of the United States mm -hmm. because, you know, it was at the expense of the American security, the way they supplied uh, Israel. Of course, the AIDS, as you know, every Israeli soldier receives $13,000 a year as a, from a taxpayer in the United States. From the United States? From the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And forget about the other AIDS, forget about even the... Uh, aid given by Zionist organization directly or indirectly mm -hmm. to the Israeli government. This is just government. 
It's government. government. Yes, yeah, right. it is a taxpayer yeah, money right. to the Israeli army. Three to four billion dollars a year. Thirteen thousand yeah. dollars for every soldier, and mm -hmm. this is I got it from Harvard magazine. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Harvard magazine cannot be accused of being unfair to Israel. All right. Yeah. So uh, the question of it's not a small country; it's the most militaristic country, it's expansionist country, and uh, it receives aid not only from the West but certainly from the United States all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's out of proportion, really, in terms of military as well as in terms of uh, monetary and economic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in no time, really, the Arabs were the sort of the one who started the war. Also, the Israeli propaganda, the Zionist propaganda, including, unfortunately, some of the well-respected papers in the United States, always depicts the Arab of being the aggressor or being the started the war. But see who is occupying who. Now Israel occupies southern Lebanon. It, of course, it invaded Lebanon. It occupies the Jolan Heights of Syria. It occupies the West Bank and still claims being the victim of aggression. Yeah. And the Arab, Mr. Arafat, the Arab government, the summits in Casablanca and Algeria and Baghdad calling for peaceful settlement in accordance with the resolution 242. Mm -hmm. And this was the United States has been urging. Mm -hmm. Yet the Israeli government has been able to blackmail, I would dare say, even the American government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they think that maybe by being strong, by being aggressive, that they can gain their ends. And this is the, the view of Mr. Shamir or many of the people of the Likud, it goes back to the Stern Gang mentality in a certain sense, that form the country that they think they must be aggressive in order to get that which they want. Yes, but, but this again... And they seem to have been rewarded in a certain sense. Well, rewarded in the sense that of um, assuming power and uh, gaining the sort of uh, sympathetic uh, majority in, in Israel, perhaps. But I believe in the long run, they are endangering the national security of the of Israel itself, uh -huh. because nowadays, as I mentioned, it's impossible to have absolute security. Uh -huh. Israel has the weapons, other Arab countries can also manufacture or get the weapons, and nowadays you don't have to cross the borders in order to fight a war. Yeah. You can use missile, you can use other weapons, the way Israelis did, for example, uh, against Iraq, against uh, Lebanon, against Syria, against Egypt. Yeah, and the way they did against your country back in 1981 when they bombed your uh, 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 an atomic generator plant. Sure. talk about that. That yes, was somehow... You see, that was the most dangerous and the most irresponsible and reckless act because fortunately there was no sort of... Uh, it was not operational, as you know. It was still under construction and the French engineers were there. The International Energy Agency, of course, were respecting uh, that uh, reactor. But it could have, of course, caused the radiation and could have really destroyed Baghdad, not only Baghdad, but even neighboring countries. Maybe to spell it out a little bit, 1981 this was, that you were build, Iraq was building outside of Baghdad a nuclear generating plant, right? right? Wanting to build an alternative energy underpinning to your economy? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, of course, for peaceful purposes, yes. and, uh, you are, we are nuclear age, and unless you have, you develop your engineers and you harness the nuclear forces for energy and medical purposes and other purposes, you'll be remain backward country. France and France that was built yeah. by the French mm -hmm. uh, companies under the um, arrangement with the French government, which provided specifically that it should not be used except for peaceful purposes. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Iraq is a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we have opened all our facilities to the International Energy Agency. They keep regularly coming to Iraq, and they have access to every facility in the country. Unlike Israel, which has refused to sign that agreement, has refused even to let American senators inspect their nuclear facility. That's right. And they have always committed aggression against Iraq without any propagation. You know, at the time we were defending our land, our borders against the Khomeini forces. Yes, right. And they took advantage of that to launch a surprise attack and to destroy the a nuclear reactor. They came t with, with airplane, and they came and bombed yes, the nuclear reactor. They, they, they sent 14. Uh, sort of F-16 or F-15, I don't remember actually the exact model. American-made. Uh, American-made, and uh, they were able to uh, avoid, say, sort of radar detection, and they bombed the facilities. Uh -huh. and, uh, loss of life, there was loss of life, obviously. Well, it wasn't, uh, the, certainly there was some engineers uh, and they, uh, some casualties, but basically it was an act of aggression and a dangerous act of aggression. Indeed, because as I was. mentioned, uh, fortunately there wasn't much of radiation. But otherwise, could have really destroyed the whole city about that. And the rationale for this is that this is a plant that might lead to Iraq being able to develop atomic capability that could be possibly used against Israel. Is this the, what that, was the rationale? That, that's, that is the, 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 the pretext. Yeah. But actually, what the Israelis are trying to uh, say that they would like to exercise a veto against uh, not only Iraq but all other Arab countries to limit their development. 
I'm sure sometime they might uh, claim that this university or this research institute or thought might be for disease, for agriculture and so on, but it's going to be for military purposes and they claim the right to attack. So assuming, I mean, if every country would follow such a policy, mm -hmm. the whole world would be destroyed. That's right. And that's what Israel is making really by its irresponsible policy. It might, uh, other countries might follow suit. It was uh, Iraq's unfortunate position to be able not to react to that egregious uh, violation of your territorial integrity and so forth. You weren't in a position to do anything about that. We, we were at war yes, uh, we were uh, along the borders, right. all the borders between Iraq and Iran. Uh -huh. And uh, but nowadays, uh, as we, our president made it very clear, that any aggression committed by Israel against Iraq. Uh, such, as not, they had proof. such as they did in 1970, in 1981, such as they made several military leaders, as Mr. Shamir threatened actually to launch an attack against Iraq, they would not go unpunished. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But we will never take the first step. If an actual act of aggression committed by Israel, Iraq, like any self-respecting country, of course, would retaliate and we make the Israeli government pay a price for it. But in that 1981 example, there was nothing really that you could do except no. to suffer that... Uh, not Does it really. Sense the way uh, Libya had to suffer the American attack upon them, or uh, 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 you know, there was no, there was no, there was nothing you could do against it. And one would want to Don't start. forget that the armed conflict, which mm -hmm. uh, lasted for eight years between Iraq and Iran, yes. was a conflict which really aimed to the destruction of the state of Iraq mm -hmm. and the destruction of our army. So it wasn't really a matter of border clashes or border conflict between the two. And at the time, Iraq could not really engage into war or defend itself against two enemies, two vicious enemies, mm -hmm. the Israelis as well as the Iranians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but now, fortunately, the war is over, the fighting rather, uh, with the Iranians is over, and hopefully we'll reach a peaceful settlement with them. And we can really mobilize our resources for our own development, mm -hmm. hoping that no other country will think of committing another aggression against Iraq. Yeah, particularly now, you have been tempered in war, the tempering experience, one certainly wouldn't encourage war having suffered itself, but you were tempered and were in a certain sense fighting Trump if you need be, if anyone tries to do that again. Your president made that clear the other uh, other day in, in, in the international uh, announcement that uh, he would be able to retaliate in this case That's if that were the case, but and appropriately so. But I have to uh, here take advantage of this occasion to say how biased sometimes the American mass media and the American papers and. Uh, depicting the statement made by our president as if that he was sort of uh, happy to launch an aggression or an, an act of war against Israel mm -hmm. without quoting really the full context of the president's statement mainly saying that well Israel had been threatening Iraq mm -hmm. Israel did commit an aggression in 1981 against our nuclear peaceful facility mm -hmm. but they have to be careful this time if they do launch aggression against Iraq then we would retaliate yeah, we're, and we're ready and able and to we are ready and able. Be ready to know that. And I think in this statement, perhaps the president averted a war because we had information that the Israelis really were about to launch an attack against Iraq. They were going to launch an attack against where yes. in Iraq? Well, you know, I, do, I assume some um, military facilities or some industrial complexes. I, I really I don't know exactly. Uh -huh. But we were convinced that they were about to launch another attack. Uh -huh. And in order to prevent them, so we had to make it public in this way. And we believe that perhaps we succeeded in not, if not eliminating, at least postponing such an act of aggression by the Israelis. Right. You said earlier that there had been, a, <coughs> excuse me, there had been a, uh, a, an attitude toward Iraq that had been expressed in the media. That is a problem in terms of the perception of the uh, Arab world that has been gained by the American people through the media. It's an imbalanced view in terms of the realities of the Middle East that might not only serve uh, uh, badly the Arab world, as it were, but also the American people in their thinking in terms of trying to arrive at what is in the long-term best interest of the United States. There's a media bias that you're easily able to perceive as you... As Indeed, you uh, I don't think anyone would deny, uh, mm. not even the uh, media people here, mm. that they are very much biased, not only against uh, Iraq and the other Arab countries, but I'm afraid even they are doing a great disservice to the American people mm. by uh, selling them half-truths, by oversimplifying things, by uh, uh, sort of in instilling in them a prejudice against the Arab nation, despite the fact that the Arab people, you know, are not only peaceful, but they have contributed to human civilization, Absolutely. and they are far more advanced than what the Israeli lobby, I mean, would try to depict the Arabs mm. to be. 
But I'm afraid that the Americans really become becoming so indoctrinated with half truths and lies that in the long run they uh, uh, it might work very much against the American interest. Mm -hmm. And this might be because the APEC and the Zionist lobby and the the influence has been so very very strong in American domestic politics that Americans tend to be insular and ethnocentric in their thinking. They don't think enough. Those people who do have a special interest in that part of the world have an inordinate uh, influence on Congress and on shaping national policy. Indeed, indeed. And uh, this in turn feeds back through the media. And so indeed. Forth. And, and uh, uh, this is, of course, is done by well-organized sort of lobbyists, uh, whether it's IPAC or other Zionist organization. And they have succeeded, even though the American people are known to be fair-minded. They would like to have everyone have his, 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 his ability to defend his case, to present his case. But obviously, in the, when it comes to the Arab cause, uh, the Americans have really been misled and uh, done a great disservice by the, uh, those who don't like to have the American people understand the reality and the injustices which the Israelis and the Zionists have inflicted on the Arab people and on the Palestinians in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when one looks at that and you would have that happen, you tend to demonize or dehumanize the enemy, as it were, from the Israeli perspective, the Zionist perspective, the Arab nation is the enemy indeed, that they see. Indeed, and, uh, you know, and you this, see this, this conflict is perhaps the major problem or flashpoint as far as the, the world is, con is concerned. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very dangerous area of the world. It's one that is very, very ill understood, and it's one that we have, uh, in, uh, we in the United States, in the West, should understand that far better and see past some of the propaganda that even our own government and some of these special interests are, are advocating. At the Arab summit, you said that there was, a, there was this question of the settlement of the, uh, was the major item. There was also other items that was brought up at the Arab summit. Well, uh, yes, uh, there are two uh, main items. The second item was that uh, any threat against Iraq, as I said, because uh, the summit was held at a time when Iraq was receiving so many threats, not only from Israel, but some uh, uh, what we perceived as a sort of conspiracies. I mean, because there were so many claims and rumors about uh, uh, Iraqis trying to smuggle things and uh, whatever, you know, we buy a pipeline would become sort of a, uh, a super can. gun. Yeah. Uh, some electrical devices would become nuclear triggers and all these lies and half truths. Uh, so the summit really uh, showed that the whole Arab countries were uh, in solidarity, were in support of Iraq. Because some of the propaganda, which again, unfortunately, in the Western media, Western media, you see that the Iraq is still going to be a threat, uh, not only to Israel but to Kuwait, to Egypt, or to Saudi Arabia, and the Iraq is going to blackmail the region and so on, which is totally false. It's Time totally magazine, unfair. Time magazine read a, a, Even a, a picture uh, of your president saying the most dangerous man in the world. Well, which is an act of you know. really a uh, sort of. Uh, uh, racist yes. gesture, I would say, uh, right. uh, on the part of, of time, even mm. though otherwise it's a decent paper, mm. a decent magazine. So for the Arab to have uh, unanimously declared their support and their solidarity with Iraq and announcing that any aggression against Iraq would be aggression against all other Arab countries, that was a very important gesture. Mm -hmm. First to uh, show that the claim that Iraq really is danger to any Arab country, it's false, otherwise they would not support Iraq. And secondly, to let the whole world know that Iraq is not alone in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another item, of course, uh, because again, the, due to biased propaganda, which try to limit Iraq's ability to develop its society, to gain access to advanced technology, whether in terms of medicine, industry, agriculture, and computer, and so on and so forth, by claiming that anything which Iraq strikes to import from the West or from Europe or from the United States has some military use, thereby it should not be allowed to. But as you know, millions of items of the world have only commercial as well as military use. And really our policy is not to become a military power in the region as much as to advance our society and to gain access to modern technology. And there has been there has been a systematic blockage to the receiving by Iraq and other Arab countries of advanced technology. Indeed, indeed. Again, again in, in, American the name, again, in the name of the possible threat to Israeli security mm -hmm. that the economic or technological advancement of the Arab nations would represent? Surely. You know, actually the ultimate policy. logic of Israel saying that any Arab country, if it is really highly advanced and highly powerful, is dangerous to Israel, uh -huh. which means that the Arab had to remain backward, weak, 
and uh, disunited so that for Israel, or rather for the uh, Zionist uh, militants in the Israeli regime, to um, remain the only secure country. And this policy has been able to find its way into legislation, into actual uh, attitude and policy on the part of the United States toward Arab countries? Well, indeed. Uh, uh, as you know, in many ways, uh, uh, there were some uh, sort of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, or Kuwait, or even Bahrain, wanted to buy some weapons from the United States uh, to further the military research in the United States for the U.S. benefit, and they were blocked by some members of the Senate or the House. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit that, unfortunately, although the vast majority are uh, patriotic, loyal to their American uh, heritage and the American national interest. But you do have some members in the Senate and the House who are so demagogue, they have the interest of Israel far above the interest of anyone else. And unfortunately, most of the time, they target the Arab countries in their one name or another in order to serve the interests of Israel, even in violation of the American interest. This becomes just almost irrational from the standpoint of the Arab uh, peoples, or let's say then there's a broader constituency as it were, the Islamic peoples, and to a certain very real sense, the, uh, the, the, uh, the broader world in, 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 in general. This attitude toward the developing world that we must keep uh, technology, must keep them uh, weak as it were, in a certain sense uh, finds expression in, 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 a, in a military way. The United States, which produces uh, in Crete daily, produces hydrogen, <coughs> atomic, binary bacteriological weapons, chemical weapons, allows Israel to develop a nuclear capability obvious with advanced uh, chemical weapons and so forth. I should grin or attempt to have uh, chemical weapons uh, agreements so that the, the weaponry, advanced weaponry, can be held only by the status quo powers that be. It can't be held by other people. That in a certain sense is saying, it's all right for us to have it, but it's not all right for other people to have weaponry or to have advanced technology. This is a profoundly disturbing view of the world. Indeed, indeed. Uh, this is why we uh, have called uh, our president, as well as President Barak of Egypt and the rest of the Arab countries, and uh, for the elimination of all mass destructive weapons from the Middle East and to declare the Middle East as nuclear as well as chemical weapons free region. But as you, again, as you know, uh, Israel would oppose that because Israel would like to keep its own nuclear facilities, its own chemical facilities, and to deprive Arabs under one pretext or another. But there is another danger here in this policy because by really uh, appearing to be so irrational, so biased against the Arab, against the Muslim countries, the United States in a way is helping really to have the fundamentalists, the extremists, whether political or religious extremists, to dominate really their societies. And eventually that would be even dangerous to the United States and to American interests and to American citizens. People that are, are fundamentalistly opposed to any peace process or right. any middle ground, right. as it were. Because the people uh, feel lost hope that one day, uh, say, uh, the United States would really take such a firm stand and to be so fair in dealing with the Arabs, so that thereby people start believing the extremists, that they forget about reason, forget about the possibility of reaching a friendly sort of uh, relationship with the United States, as all Arab countries would like to uh, mm -hmm. really reach, uh, because there is no hope for the United States to, to uh, come to terms with the Arabs. And people, with their you know, frustration, with their, uh, uh, they are so desperate, sometimes they lend support and believe in what they the extremists tell them. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. But here again, uh, it's a vicious circle. It's, it's not only against the Arab interests, against the Muslim interests, for the extremists to prevail or to dominate their societies, but in the long run, it's against the interests of everyone. Yes, indeed it would be, because this yes. would, and this could lead to war. This could lead uh, to, uh, we've had cycles of war in the past over, uh, you know, the Middle East, over the Israeli, Western, uh, Arab, I think. Um, is there a danger of that now? Well, unfortunately there is. Although uh, any rational uh, sort of government or any rational uh, person would tell you that really war is, is, is no good for anything. Mm. It's going to just to destroy even the very objective that you might wage war in order to achieve. And that war is no longer really uh, an effective instrument to gain any sort of national interest. But still, when things are left in the hands of extremists such as Mr. Shamir, 
uh, or any other extremists, uh, whether in the Arab world or outside the uh, Arab world, uh, anything could happen. These people are irrational, they are so dogmatic, so blind to reason, that they could commit any crime. Uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they're convinced that they're correct. They, they are imbued with a sense of mission, right. they're imbued with a sense of their own righteousness, as it were, in a very real right. sense, that makes it dangerous for them, uh, it makes it particularly dangerous uh, for that particular part of the world. What do you think would satisfy them, or what is likely to be the uh, out, 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 uh, come of this? There's a rather large peace movement that's beginning to form in Israel itself. There are some people within the Judaic community. Do you think that there could, within the United States, that see peace now, that to, uh, to go along with the idea of that? Do you think that there could be uh, the, the extreme position that the Israeli government is taking could lead to a severing of the almost knee-jerk support of the American Jewish community for what Israel is doing, and there could be a severing of that relationship. Uh, some people have said Israel could not possibly stand. It's an extension of the United States, uh, as it were, in the Jewish community within the United States. Could you see a severing of that close tie? Or, I, I think eventually, a, I think emerging? eventually, a lot of people would realize that the best interest of the Jewish people is to save Israel from the people like Shamir and others. Mm. And that the only way for Israel to survive uh, is really to be on good term, on peaceful term with its neighbors. Otherwise, it cannot really continue forever to be the arch enemy of its neighbors. And yet, as you said earlier, it's a small country, a small population. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how powerful, no matter how uh, great uh, support uh, which are given to Israel under one pretext or another, eventually, uh, I believe Israel would destroy itself. As you know, even now, Israel really economy is not a viable economy. Israel yeah, really yeah. lives yeah. lives at the charity and the uh, aid given to by the United States and by other Western countries. And thumbs its nose at the, they must say, if they in Judaism, they say, uh, in, in Hebrew or the Yiddish, they say chutzpah. And they thumb their nose at the major yes. plan and the peace plan that they put and go their own uh, way in a way that just defies reason. Yes. The Unfortunately, sense. they were able to blackmail some American politicians in the past and they believe that they can continue that. But as you know, you cannot continue that forever. Uh, I believe the American people eventually would see the truth and would realize that they are really not serving the interests of even the Jewish people, whether here or in, in the Middle East, by supporting Israel blindly. Uh, by supporting Israel blindly. Do you think the current government is going to try and establish uh, uh, the annexation of the West Bank, the expulsion of Arabs? How far will they go? How far will well, that, that's they carry the, forth with uh, almost to where Mr. the kind of things that Mr. Kahane has been talking about over the years? Yeah, well, that's the logical, really, uh, outcome of their policy. Even though they deny it for public relation purposes, but that's the, uh, when you bring in about one million Soviet or Polish or other uh, Jews to settle in the occupied territories, you cannot do that unless you destroy, you eliminate, or you kick out the Arab population from that land. Mm -hmm. But to pretend otherwise, to really think of the rest of the world as being fools, but you cannot escape the conclusion that this is really the design, this is really the eventual outcome if Israel succeeded in carrying out its policy. Mm -hmm. And then they have to uh, try and get uh, $400 million from the United States in order to build new housing. They already so got forth. it. They and already they, got they it. They get that and there are going to be new appeals. Yeah. And it, it does ultimately come back to the United States and the support of the United States because they couldn't, they couldn't stand without that continuing support of the United States. Do you think not this builds the fact that the United States is so in support of the Israeli cause, which becomes in the minds of many increasingly irrational in terms of its uh, projection, is earning us many, many, uh, to use an overworked term, enemies, as it were, within the Arab and within the broader Islamic community, and then therefore is serving against the long-term interests of the United States? And uh, I mean, as citizens, we might be well to rethink our view on that. Well, I t you'd be surprised America. to uh, uh, hear this, that I believe most Arabs know that the American people, had they known the truth, would have taken a more fair, fairer and uh, more rational approach to the Middle East crisis. They know that the American people are really uh, misled by the mass media, by the um, IPAC, by some other Zionist organization. Otherwise, their sense of justice, they would not allow them to do that. This is why only the extremists, which I really uh, sort of, uh, are, you may classify them as enemies of America, 
but the vast majority of course of governments as well as of the uh, Arab population and the Muslim uh, population they know that basically at deep at heart the Americans are good people and that they would uh, really be sort of a source of, of uh, peace and uh, goodness in the world rather than being uh, a country of aggression and supporting uh, any other aggressors. They know that. But at the same Most time, people, the everyday yes. reality is that that's, that, that's true. Think. That's true. This is why we are hopeful that eventually, and as you m mentioned earlier, day after day, uh, really the cause of peace and the sense of justice is gaining more and more among American people, and I hope even inside Israel. The, 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 uh, just one last thing on this, ro uh, on this uh, segment as we're talking with you is the, uh, the role of the media is influenced by, inordinately by, the Zionist interests as far as the Middle East is concerned? The sure. American media is influenced by that? Sure. You know, also the American media, of course, seek the protection and the benefits of the First Amendment and the freedom of speech. But we shouldn't forget that these are commercial enterprises. Mm -hmm. These are owned by some millionaires. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look for one reason or another, they are really far more biased against the Arabs and they, than any other nation, I would say. Mm. Uh, Perhaps because they don't see enough of an interest as far as the Arab American community, although that American community is growing. Uh, Islam is the lar second largest religion in the United States now, and there's a larger constituency here, and uh, so that's another that's another aspect. But it does bring it back to the fact that uh, the problem very often, which is seen in the Middle East, is really born here in the United States, and the problem might be well addressed to be uh, might well be addressed here in the United that's States. That's true. That's yeah. true. Actually, just uh, I mean, this interview is a sign how that really the Arab cause and the uh, sort of, uh, the, I would say, and ultimately the American cause is being served by more and more people. And we closed the last segment talking about the media bias and the fact that here in the United States the, the media is increasingly responsible for shaping national consciousness, has a pol quasi-political role. I think that's one throughout the world that we can see the media is more and more uh, 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 of significance. Uh, uh, the fact that the Arab summit was held, um, uh, there should be more media outreach of that. There, have, there was some filming of that and there was some uh, media outreach of uh, the messages that went from the, uh, from the Arab summit. I wonder if I could ask you, were you here in the United States during the summit? Were yes. you there? Yes. Or were you able to get a sense of how well was that Arab summit uh, uh, covered, as it were, by the media? How, how good an impression did we receive here in the United States of the significance of that uh, by the filtration process of the media and the gatekeepers and so forth here in the United States. That's as one who was familiar with what was going well, on. Well, as a matter of fact, I was in Geneva to attend the special session of Security Council I concerning see. the uh, uh, Jewish-Soviet migration to uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. However, I asked my office to keep the um, American papers, which I read, and on going, coming back, I did uh, see that really scant uh, coverage, uh, mm -hmm. even by a, a paper such as the New York Times mm -hmm. or the Washington mm -hmm. Post. Apart from a few lines, really there was no reference. Uh -huh. So this is, again, one uh, phase or one aspect of the bias against the Arabs by just keeping quiet and mm -hmm. silent without really telling the American people or the rest of the world what's going on in the Arab world. Much less because in the electronic, of, yes. much less in the electronic press. Right? Much I less mean, in the electronic, of course. I don't believe there was any reference to the summit by any of the networks here. Uh -huh. Even so, much of the final communique was sort of a very constructive and trying to really approach international problem or the Middle East problem in a very constructive way, uh -huh. which is a trend that should be encouraged, should be highlighted. but. Uh, Again, they prefer to keep quiet about it and commission it. They, return, they prefer to keep quiet about it because in a very real sense, they, there, there's a feeling among many of the people in the media that A, it wouldn't uh, be of interest to people, B, it would be uh, promoting the agenda of someone that they tend to associate with being on the other side, as right. it were, yes. of, of a major question. And this is working against the long-term interests of the informing the American people. Um, there was footage taken, obviously. The, maybe you could just spell out the dimensions. It was a, it was a, a major gathering of the, the heads of the Arab countries uh, that were there. How long did the, how long did the conference take place? Well, it lasted three days. It lasted three days. Uh, and uh, really it was an in-depth, uh, in a way, uh, summit in the sense that trying to uh, analyze and to uh, sort of plan the Arab policy in the 21st century. Uh -huh. As you know, for the last few years, with uh, all the 
breathtaking developments taking place in Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, throughout the world. I believe any other nation uh, should really try to figure out where its position, where its best interest lies. Mm -hmm. And that's even the, for the first time in the history of the Arab summits that the Arab leaders would really come together and instead of exchanging just pieces, but trying to understand and to draw a policy for the Arab nation in the long run in view of you know, the recent development and as members of the international community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is why it is actually, it was described as being the summit of the summits in the sense of drawing the agenda for the future of the Arab nation and not just for the immediate uh, or acute crisis or problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there had been in the previous one in, in Kuwait, so there had been this immediate problem of the of the Gulf War that had been raging and so forth. Things have, uh, in a certain sense, settled in. The Israeli position, the immigration of the Soviets into the uh, Soviet immigrants into there, the establishment of the Shabir government, some of these kind of things. It's solidifying, as a sense. Was there a sense of unity among the Arab peoples, do you think, that came out of this summit? They've been divided themselves among their, their own interests, uh, fighting one with another, as you're well aware, and so forth. But do you think there was a sense of unity that emerged out of the Arab summit, and that the Arab uh, nation itself, the broader nation, is, is any closer now to uh, being able to talk with a unified voice, or Indeed. how do you feel about Very that? much so. As you know, in recent years, uh, a new phenomenon, so, so to speak, uh, emerged in the Arab world, namely to have regional groupings for uh, not political or military, but basically for cultural, economic, uh, technological uh, groupings. And this is why you have three groups now. Uh, the first one was the Arab Gulf Cooperation Council which uh, consists of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman, Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain. Mm -hmm. The second grouping, which consists of uh, Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, and Yemen. As you know now, Yemen had been united, yes, the south has. and the north, and it was just the Republic of Yemen, mm -hmm. for important countries. And the third grouping, which consists of North African, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, uh, and Mauritania. Yeah. Uh, now, these three groupings are, on, on the, they always coordinate their activities, whether via the Arab League or directly with them. And again, the emphasis on economic integration. Mm -hmm. And by taking the Arab unity, which is the old dream of all the Arabs, yes. in a very pragmatic way, and trying to lay the foundation gradually in various technical fields, in various agricultural, commercial, and economic and financial things, we believe eventually this would be in the interest of everyone in the mm -hmm. sense of securing stability and security of the region, which is going to benefit every uh, country in the Middle East. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, and again, back to this question of the need to be able to have access to technology yes. so that you can build your infrastructure and you can build the needs to develop into uh, modern industrialized countries. This uh, is a, a major problem. That's, that's uh, actually indeed, uh, as you know, the whole world uh, is thinking of 1992. Yes, indeed. When uh, the whole of Europe, uh, in a way, becomes one market. Uh -huh. And for the Arab countries, uh, whether directly or through their group, are we are approaching the EEC in order to reach some sort of arrangement with them in a way to become partners in this world. It's no longer it's possible really to just to compete with everyone. Uh -huh. I believe uh, although competition might be healthy for any economy, but basically we have to be partners in this globe. Uh, uh -huh. We are all facing some major problems, whether in terms of environment, in terms of the human rights issues, in terms of technology. And uh, small or big countries have to cooperate with the rest of the world. In uh, that's right. And as blessed as many of the countries are, Iraq being one, is blessed with oil revenue, which has been uh, of a great benefit in terms Indeed. of being able uh, to give, uh, you know, uh, 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 the movement toward uh, modernization and so forth. Those resources will run out. It's important that they be able to build an infrastructure, to build the educational base, to build the technological base, to build a modern uh, world society, uh, society in keeping with the world. And for that, you need access to the, to the education and to the technologies of the world. And we can't allow countries to uh, say that you cannot be allowed to progress, because if you do, you might possibly be a threat to another area in the world. I can see well, now where that was such an you important You see, actually, issue. nowadays, many people, many economists believe that the basic uh, factor for production is knowledge. Uh -huh. It's not capital or land or labor as they used to, the classical theory. Mm -hmm. So without knowledge, really, you can go nowhere. 
and you cannot even survive in this world. And uh, of course, in order to gain knowledge, you have to uh, get access to modern technology, to spend money on education, on education institution, and so on. Yeah. And here, in this respect, I might uh, mention that uh, we are a very happy country in the sense of having balanced resources, land, water, people, as well as mineral and oil. Mm -hmm. And we have the skill and the ability to initiate our own industries or technologies, also this doesn't mean we have to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world or mm -hmm. that we can really dispense with the cooperation of the world. Uh, but to show you the priorities which we give to education and to knowledge, even though we were engaged in a, a devastating war for eight years, Indeed. we built so many new universities and education institutions throughout the country, ah, so. in the south, in the north, as well as in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also managed to continue to develop our oil uh, resources so much so that we have now uh, almost the same capacity which Iraq used to enjoy before the war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we believe that given 10 years of peace, the whole Arab world really would be far ahead, far more advanced than it is now. And this would, this would serve not only the Arab world, but this would serve the stability of the world. Of course, and, and I mean, throughout country. the world. Uh, Obviously, this is the kind of uh, Arab world that one would want to see, sure. a developing and progressive one. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think, uh, without uh, the sort of uh, belittling, the generosity uh, and the assistance given by the United States, by the Western countries, by Soviet Union to the end of the world world. But I don't think anyone who has been more generous than the Arab countries in assisting their fellow sort of uh, uh, countries in the non-aligned movement in the third world countries. Yeah. I myself, uh, just to give an example of one country such as mine, yeah. uh, before joining the Foreign Service, I was the president of the Iraq Fund for External Development. Yeah. And I believe in a period of three years, Iraq, which is relatively a small country, we are a population of just 16 million uh, persons, we granted, in terms of soft loans, $1.75 billion mm -hmm. to about 32 countries in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, and Latin America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and other countries even gave more. Mm -hmm. And we continue to give more, mm -hmm. whether directly, bilaterally, or through various institutions, yes, uh -huh. whether World Bank or OPEC Fund or the Islamic Development Fund or mm -hmm. the IFAD, the International Agricultural Development Fund. Uh, but we believe that really unless your neighbor is well off, you cannot be really uh, sort of stable and well off. Well, it might be very well that you've been able to do that. Many of the people in the Arab countries uh, had themselves not so long ago been um, uh, relatively underdeveloped, as it were, sure. before oil was discovered. Yes. They suffered the yoke of colonialism, uh, European colonialism, uh, very profoundly, so that they know what it is in a very real sense to suffer the oppression of a colonialist, uh, imperialist, to use the term, uh, uh, influence in, in the world so that they could uh, resonate to the needs of the lesser developed peoples within the third world. Yes. And if anything is needed in this world as we begin to look ahead, it is that as we look at the West, which some people can see as being increasingly arrogant in their uh, sense of, uh, I mean by the West, the Western Europe or even the United States or let's say Israel or Japan, being arrogant in their attitude toward the developing world, there needs to be a moderating area of the world that can talk to the needs of the third world and be sensitive to that. If you understand what I mean, yes. and that green belt, as it were, of the Arab world or Islamic world might be exactly that moderating zone between those two parts of the, of the third, uh, of, the, of the north and the south countries. And no question is of greater importance uh, in terms of the survival of the human species we begin to look ahead. Indeed. Uh, actually, you are right in saying that many uh, Western powers are getting more arrogant, but fortunately there is another trend. I mean, more and more, and we see it here at the United Nations, people realize really that we on this globe, we have to be partners and we have to cooperate in order to survive together. Mm -hmm. And I believe throughout the world, in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, you have strong voices now toward this direction. And we see it now with the United Nations. More and more, all member countries working on consensus basis, rather than confrontation or vetoes and other things. Okay, yeah, good, to so yeah. the degree that we can have those things. Well, uh, now, this is we had, a, we had a hard time getting uh, observers to go into the occupied territory. They almost wanted to bring the UN into a special 
organizing for peace organization yes. to get around the American Israeli yes. so Well, I would consider it. remain, yeah. and, and it's a certain, is, a, is it a representation of the arrogance that That's true. very but often emanates from the Zionist influence on the United yeah. States? But I believe here in this respect, the policy of Israel is reducing Israel to a fringe, to an outlaw, really, power in this world. And uh, in the long run, they would not be able to resist uh, such a global sort of movement for peace and cooperation. Uh, but the mainstream, and as I mentioned, we saw it in the United, in, in the United Nations, that now it's so more and more for consensus. Yeah. Although it was unfortunate that the United States used its veto uh, in Geneva against you know, the idea of sending some observers in order not to do anything but to provide for the protection of the Palestinian children, Palestinian women, and Palestinian farmers. Mm -hmm. For one reason or another, the United States did veto that um, uh, resolution over all, all its partners, all the permanent member countries yeah. uh, in the Security Council, and the non permanent all unanimously voted for that resolution, it just makes you scratch with the exception head. of the United States. It almost makes you scratch your head. Well, uh, what is this that's going on in a, in a, cer in a, in a, in a, in a certain sense? One, one looks at that attitude and the, and the consensus within the United Nations against that, and then yet there is this bulldog attitude on the part of those uh, people, and one, one begins to wonder what, if it's almost like Meshuggah, as they say, that it's almost uh, beyond the fringe, and yet we, we continue to support, we continue to support that, that attitude, and uh, this is one thing that had to be brought up as far as the, the, Arab, uh, the, Arab, uh, the Arab summit was concerned. One would hope that we uh, might be able to have some sort of uh, light shed on, on that particular that particular uh, that particular area of the world. Um, you can't just as an Arab nation. It might be good again. You're part of the Arab nation. It's a broader Arab nation. You can't just certain, in a certain sense say, well, the Palestinian people have lost to the Hebrew or the Zionist people. They lost. Uh, you could say the Normans conquered the Anglo-Saxons. You could say that the Islam established itself in other parts of the world over forces that had been there before. We can't just say, as part of the Arab nation, the Palestinian people have lost, the Israelis won, the Israelis are prevailing, we must give them what they want, we must give them and let them have their state and sacrifice the Palestinian people and take the attitude that the Israelis are essentially correct, that they should have all of Palestine. Do you understand what I'm saying? If yes. we were to go all the way, what would be yeah, the but I, I, I wouldn't really describe the situation like that. I mean, uh, after all, uh, uh, the Palestinians, despite the fact that all the odds have been against them since 19, not only 1914, since 1917, you know, but they have not lost their identity, they have not lost their will to survive and to have their own country and their own nation. Despite the fact that all the Israelis, I mean, attempt to destroy the Palestinians by physical liquidation, as they did when they attacked Tunisia, you know, the headquarters mm -hmm. of the PLO, mm -hmm. as they did when they attacked uh, the Palestinian camps in Lebanon, mm -hmm. as they did on many occasions, whether in the Western Bank or uh, in Jordan, but the Palestinians have continued to struggle throughout the world, not only just in the Middle East, and we believe that eventually they would be the winner, in the sense that having their own state. The Palestinians, now they believe that everyone should live in peace in the region, and they are ready to recognize Israel and to live in peace with the Israelis, provided that the Israelis would grant them the right for self-determination. Mm, from, the, from the standpoint of the Israeli Shemir government, it would be for the Arab nation to say to the Palestinian people, you've lost, you have nothing, you should have nothing, you deserve nothing. Uh, you're a group of the Arab nation that is just to be lost to history. You have not, and to take that attitude, if the Arab nation took that attitude the, toward the Palestinians, then of the problem would go away. You see, it is not just a question of Palestinians. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Is that they, all they have to do is throw the Palestinian people overboard, as it were, or to throw You, you see, the, the Nazis, yeah, yeah, Hitler, yeah, 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 yeah. tried to liquidate the Jewish people, mm -hmm. but they failed, of course, mm -hmm. and they lost the war. I believe anyone who tried to liquidate the Palestinian or the Arab would have the same destiny as Hitler. And for those who have their reasons leave, they can bring all sorts of monsters to their people as well as to their own. Mm. But the Palestinians definitely, now they believe in peace, and the Arab nations support them in this endeavor, and eventually, I believe, eventually, uh, some peaceful solution to their problem, to their tragedy, had to be worked out. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope that some peaceful solution could be worked out, because if it continues to build up in the, in the, in the thing, in the, in the dialectic of war, uh, eventually this could come around, uh, let's hope it would not have to come to that, but uh, an all-out confrontation between the larger Arab nation, if the forces of, 
of uh, violence were to be able to be uh, marshaled and on the Israeli side, it would be a devastating kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, encounter that okay. could occur there and is one that would have to be avoided by at, at all costs. Such is a possibility. And all well, uh, let's hope that uh, despite the fact that there are some fanatic voices and forces who would like to do that, but we believe that any uh, rational leader uh, would think that uh, the future war if it uh, ever to take place in the Middle East, is going to be the most devastating war the region has ever experienced in modern time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you, it might not even be limited to uh, two or three countries. And the whole region, even from India and Pakistan, and the things might be affected by such a war. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's not going to be in the interest of anyone. I don't believe anyone's going to be sort of a winner in such a war. Mm -hmm. It simply would include collective self-destruction. Yes, that's right. Uh, and we hope that the voices of, of peace and reason would prevail eventually everywhere, so that people like Shamir and his uh, likes would really um, uh, realize that uh, uh, they cannot uh, fool uh, the rest of their people and the rest of their, the world by their demagoguery and their warlike propaganda. Can't fool all of the people all of the time, said so so, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And, so, and more and more important reasons why the Arab summit should have been called, that the Arab uh, people's uh, leadership should have come together uh, to find common cause uh, toward uh, asserting, asserting themselves firmly and in the, uh, in the interests of a long-term peace, and more importantly, that those messages of that leadership and of that Arab nation should be more widely disseminated here in the United States so that we could begin to see that there are alternative voices uh, coming from that side of things, as it were, other than just the demonized propagandistic uh, you know, view that so much of our media projects onto it. Uh, the, the Arab world is, is, uh, is not a sort of a, a fringe region of the world. It's very important strategically. It's very important in terms of natural resources, not just oil. It, it, is, it occupies uh, quite a... Uh, major part in Africa as well in Asia and I believe eventually uh, the Arab uh, countries would uh, uh, become a force to be reckoned with uh, for the achievement of peace and stability throughout the world Absolutely. and the Arab summit as you know this is an international trend you see how many summits have been held mm -hmm. I mean the European meets you know every six months mm -hmm. I mean, the Soviet Union and the United States hold so many summits uh, the African countries also in the summits and the Arab countries have to do likewise mm -hmm. and I believe in now one of the decision of the Baghdad summit uh, is that every year the Arab summit should be held either in the Arab League headquarters in Cairo or in any other Arab capitals. Well, but it's no longer a matter of invitation by one country or another. I now see, it's right. every year had to be. Ongoing right. In view of the fact that so many of the problems as uh, far as Israel is concerned is supported by the United States, maybe the a Arab summit should be held in New York to get at the problem where so many of the problems are to finally find expression in the Middle East. That's a little cavalier to say that, but the Arab, I'm glad to hear that they've been able to put those uh, those meetings together and that you've been able to, you, your country was the host to that, yes. and I want to thank you very That's much, my pleasure. sorry, it's my we're pleasure. running out of time for this particular segment, uh, for helping to share some of these perceptions uh, with us, uh, with, the, with the television audience. Again, we thank you very, very much for um, for inviting us here to talk with you on this on this subject. It was very interesting, and we do remind you in the cable television audience, it has been your pleasure to have the perceptions of the current ambassador at the United Nations from the country of Iraq, uh, Dr. M Amir Mbare, and he had been uh, previously ambassador to the United States and also pre ambassador to the uh, uh, to uh, to Great Britain, and uh, we're very, very happy to be able to bring his succinct and relevant perceptions to help understand better the situation in that very, very crucial area of the world and to help highlight the importance of this uh, recently held Arab summit in his uh, capital city of Baghdad. Happy to have been able to bring you those perceptions and we thank you once again, Dr. Mbari, very much for participating. Um, we would like to invite you, on uh, invite you in the audience to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back again next week at the same time. That's it for this particular segment. Uh, Ambassador Mbari, once again, thank you very, very much indeed. Good night. We'll see you next week.